um, everything. Okay, perfect. Well, hello everyone. My name is Priya Bhitani. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar will be slightly different than our other ones. We'll focus the first half of our discussion on how to navigate the regulatory landscape in Asia, and then the second half on how to get your products approved while dealing with the COVID pandemic. Um, it's just a topic that we felt was is critical to the discussion. So we will spend a good half of our discussion on that. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with RegDesk, uh, RegDesk is a regulatory software platform that uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to make global compliance easier and faster. Our platform provides RA teams with comprehensive and updated Reg Intel, tools to collaborate with your local distributors, comprehensive tracking and reporting capability, and an application builder that uses AI to enable teams to prepare technical files within hours rather than weeks and months. Our approach to regulatory is quite unique and one that gives clients a competitive advantage. If you'd like to learn more or try out the system for free, we'd be happy to schedule a call to discuss further. Um, getting started today with us today, we have a leading expert from Singapore, Mr. Jack Wong. Mr. Wong has over 20 years of regulatory clinical trial pharmacovigilance experience in Asia, along with extensive knowledge in the fields of medical devices, pharmaceuticals, nutrition, consumer health, and biological products. He's also the founder of the Asia Regulatory Professional Association. Mr. Wong has also developed regulatory courses for more than nine universities across Asia, including NTU in Singapore, where he is in is a professor uh, uh, it, in the university in Japan, also at Sydney in Australia. Uh, Mr. Wong has worked for several of the leading top medical device and pharmaceutical companies and that too in leadership roles. So we are very excited to have Mr. Wong here today, given his expertise and experience. Uh, before we begin our discussion this morning though, I'd like to turn our attention to our attendees. Thank you again so much for joining us. At the end of this meeting, we'll hold a brief Q&A. We encourage your participation. So please refer to the chat button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. In the interest of time, please submit your questions throughout the course of our talk, and we'll try to address as many of your questions as we can. In case we run out of time, please email us your questions, and we'll try to address them via email. Um, so I also just want to point out that we'd love to get your feedback on today's webinar and ideas you may have and topics you may would you may want us to dis, uh, to cover for in the future webinars. Um, well, let's get started, uh, Mr. Wong. Welcome. It's truly a pleasure to have you here today. Hello, hello, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you for having me today, and uh, I hope. Uh, my uh, experience in Asia can contribute to the team and help the team. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so let's start off with our first half of the discussion, which is just regulations in Asia. Um, Asia in the last several years, at least from our experience, we've noticed that it has truly become this dynamic regulatory environment there, uh, which is not always easy to manage. And I understand you were invited by the Thai FDA to give training to their team and the industry just a few weeks ago. Are there any insights you can share from that meeting? Thank you, Pierre. Yes, I just uh, come back from Thailand, uh, luckily a few weeks ago, not last week. If I come back last week, I may quarantine uh, somewhere in Singapore now uh, uh, because uh, all these uh, travel restrictions nowadays in, uh, in Asia. And uh, uh, today I more try to share uh, my uh, so-called observation or insight uh, from uh, the association point of view, because uh, when Thai FDA invite me, they also invite me as an uh, association representative, which is the Asia Regulatory uh, Professional Association I'm uh, trying to represent today. And of course, if you want to know more our association, uh, feel free to uh, check out our website, asiaregulatory.com, or you can uh, find me in the LinkedIn. And of course, you can contact uh, Pia or Wetex. Uh, we are happy to provide you more uh, information. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the Thailand visit. Uh, my, my objective today is not only to tell you the Thailand situation, but I want to use the Thailand example as, uh, as uh, uh, a way to uh, share with the team 
how you can manage the so-called dynamic uh, regulatory environment in Asia uh, and using the Thailand example. Uh, before I talk about the so-called tips, let's talk about what's going on in Thailand first as a background. Uh, in terms of the uh, medical device uh, classification in Thailand, I think most of the colleagues know at the moment in Thailand, they are in a fee level. Uh, and the way they classify is not like the common way we know in US or Europe, which is based on rule or based on risk. It's really based on the product type. If you are this product type, you go to that classification for that, just for that reason. You know, it's not, it's not based on risk uh, or rule base like that. So that's the, you know, uh, current situation. Uh, but the good news is coming uh, that uh, uh, Thai FDA are thinking to have their product classification for medical device into four level. That one, most of people with familiar and which will be based on risk. And uh, in a very good reference is uh, most of the classification uh, approach in Thailand will follow the European approach. So, you know, they will have a set of rules you then you answer some questions, how long you touch your body, where you go, uh, did it need energy or not, that kinds of thing. Then you were able to determine your class one, two, three, or four based on the risk level. So to most of the, I would say company, that's good news because that, that is something you're familiar and somehow you will find the classification more predictable because you have a rule based one day you can understand and also to maybe uh, uh, lobby or negotiate with the Thai FDA if, if sometimes you don't agree with the classification decision, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, but when will they do it in terms of timeline? Um, uh, the, they are planning to do uh, focus on CAS1, switch all the CAS1 product this year, and then they will focus on CAS2 to four uh, next year. So in terms of timeline, that's their plan. Okay, now most importantly, or next important thing is the impact. What does it impact to, uh, to us or as an industry? Uh, let's look at some potential good news and also some bad news. The good news uh, is, um, for example, uh, some of my product uh, will be um, uh, drug uh, uh, in the original classification. Now it's a device because it's the uh, we have some uh, artificial tier, uh, which is function like medical device. And then that's good. Then, you know, Nick, uh, uh, next year, we will able to uh, have a, a medical device classification. The good news is the registration will be quicker because compared to drug, the pathway will be shorter. And then in terms of the uh, channel, uh, all channel we can sell now. And in terms of advertisement, which is more flexible as a medical device. And in terms of reimbursement, you know, uh, 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 that will be the potential, you know, uh, bad news because the reimbursement status of drug will gone. You no longer drug, you become device. So, you know, the team need to fight for their reimbursement pricing accordingly. So, you know, this um, uh, little example, I want the team to get a feeling is, you know, sometime a regulation change, it affects a, a lot of uh, uh, things, not just your regulatory timeline, like submission approval thing, but also you know, the sales channel, advertisement, uh, reimbursement, et cetera. So, uh, you know, that, that's something I really want the team to aware when you deal with this uh, dynamic environment in Asia, uh, there are many other so-called aspects you need to assess so that you know the overall impact. Uh, and one minor point I also want to mention is uh, uh, sometimes you may uh, classify as a device, but your classification may be different from class one, maybe to class two. Then of course your approval time will be longer. And then uh, uh, one thing you may not realize is uh, the documentation requirement in the old time, maybe your general device, which is the lowest risk and you take one to two weeks. But now you are class two, it means three months, Okay, one to two weeks to FEMA, maybe not very crazily long, but still relatively big difference, right? One to two weeks to three months. But there's one hidden thing that actually even make your approval time longer 
is not the approval time, it's your preparation time. Because when you change from general device, which is the lowest cost, to cost two, you actually need your uh, submission dossier in a so-called CSDT format, common submission dossier template. If you're in that kind of format, of course, you, your, your, your team need to spend effort, resource to build a, a, a dossier in that kind of format. That may be actually uh, at additional time, sometimes not even months, uh, I mean, not weeks. Uh, it could be more than even three months, maybe. So, you know, then, you know, that significantly increase uh, your, your so-called overall approval time again. So you know, uh, you know. So that's why you know every change in 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 whatever regulation, for example, classification, have a lot of impact. And your assessment, uh, you know, is not simply just approval time. It could be preparation, like I just mentioned, sales channel, reimbursement, advertisement. Uh, uh, so for this uh, uh, assessment thing, uh, one more tips I also want to uh, mention. Because uh, you may imagine the Thai FD official, when, when I visit them, give them the training, I realize that, you know, they are in the old system. Now they, they need to learn the new system, which is four level, European way. No, I won't say most of them, they are very familiar expert, right, on this uh, European system. So you, what does it mean? It means they need a lot of help in terms of maybe training, maybe some guidance. How, how does it work? Uh, maybe they may not able to determine it straight away uh, because don't have that many so-called European ex experience, classification experience before. So it presents a threat and opportunity. A threat to you is, my God, my regulator classified my product wrong. I need to negotiate with him every time. Wow, this is nightmare. But the opportunity also means you also present your opportunity to keep them training, you know, helping them, be a partner of them, and then help our Thai regulator prepare for this new regulation and maybe using your product as example so that they can learn your product, why classify this way, uh, how does it, uh, 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 your product also classify in Euro, US, wherever, so that they can take it as a good reference, like that. So, you know, uh, um, uh, I, I, I want to uh, pause here and I want the team to really you know, understand why, why this uh, special simple change in the Thailand case uh, you can learn and also apply to all the other regulation change in Asia. So thank you Pierre for that uh, questions. Sure, sure. And so just, just for the little bit of clarification on this. So we're not just talking about change in classification system. We're talking about a bigger change because it sounds like they're actually changing the laws associated with those classifications as well. Is that? You're, you're right up here. Uh, 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 they are actually rolling out a lot of all, all, all the changes in terms of system, quality system, uh, 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 everything. Uh, today, I just picked a classification example as, a, as a, a way to explain, you know, how they work, the impact to you, etc. But you are right, there are many other uh, changes to their system as well. Got it. Um, and I know we're getting questions around this, so which we'll address at the end. But uh, moving on, and then just one last thing. So, so Thai FDA is giving transition periods. So right now it's class one. Next year you said it'll be two, three, and four. So are they? Are they? So along with transition periods, are they sort of? Is there focus on adopting the MDR? Is that what their goal is with this change? Yes, uh, so far the current classification system is based on the European approach. So when you want to communicate with Thai FDA or you want to lobby with them, sometimes you don't agree with them wherever your classification happened to your product, uh, please use the MDR or European approach. They will understand better and will take a, a stronger reference. 
But are they also using with this change? Is there is their goal sort of to adopt the MDR? That's what they're trying to do, right? Is mm. they go for the MDR or not so much? Just the classification piece. Yeah, but but the, this this question sounds to me is a very uh, I call it a political question. You know, the Thai FDA is not here to adopt European system. Uh, that's not their mentality. Oh, we, we follow Europe. Not, 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 not for that reason. But uh, um, um, they are more following the ASEAN, you know, the ASEAN, which is the Southeast Asia countries. And because the ASEAN, uh, based on uh, drafting their regulation based on the European system as a reference, and that's why the ASEAN system look like a European system. And that's why the Thai system also, in terms of classification, also look like a European system. That may be the way. But you ask a Thai FDA official, are you following Europe? You know, they went, no, 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 we, we are following ASEAN. You know, uh, we are ASEAN country. So that would be the formal answer. So I hope I answer your question in a political correct way. You know, they follow ASEAN. Understood. And speaking of ASEAN, we have a question. Um, so, you know, Thailand is one of the ASEAN countries that follows the ASEAN directive, right? The, the AMC. Yes. So which is more uh, similar to the GHTF framework? Not that they're planning to follow the European framework, what happens to the AMDD harmonization. So you're saying they're not really planning on following European framework. They're still on planning. They're still on the trajectory to follow the AMDD harmonization. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, because there, there seems like many cycle happening. You know, there are many so-called harmonization. Uh, I, I try to simplify a little bit. So Thailand uh, is within the ASEAN country. So Thailand, politically, whatever reason, they should follow the ASEAN approach because this is their region, okay? Then look at ASEAN. ASEAN have their own directive. They call it uh, ASEAN Medical Device Directive, uh, AMDD, like you mentioned. This is the approach they want to harmonize the ASEAN, and that's the, why they create a directive. But the tips is here. When you read the term ASEAN Medical Device Directive, you can tell where they follow the guidelines from. It's Medical Device Directive. Uh, uh, the, even the name is uh, coming from there as well, you know, uh, like that. So, you know, they, they take a lot of reference of the European system, i.e. the Medical Device Directive, to develop this uh, ASEAN Directive. So the harmonization is still there. You dare not create something very odd inside ASEAN. They're still using the, you know, so-called uh, uh, a global recognized system uh, to base on. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, the ASEAN directive and the European uh, directive uh, is pretty comparable, I would say, in terms of the classification, for example. Uh, so that's, that's how they base on. Got it. Well, thank you. That, that clarification hopefully addresses the same. It's so, quite confusing maybe in Asia yeah. like that. <laughs> but no, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, let's move on because we don't have too much time left. But okay, thank you. definitely want to cover COVID. Um, it's a pandemic. It, it's here. We all have to deal with it. And there are concerns about ministries of agencies closing and the delays, potential delays that'll, that'll be caused and impact everyone. Um, in your experience, uh, you know, especially with Asia, what does one need to consider and what can foreign manufacturers do to essentially just keep pushing towards those approval times and not, and, and try to avoid the delays as much as possible? Thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. It's a very hot topic everywhere now uh, about this uh, COVID-19 uh, issue. Of course, it also impacts our regulatory life, you know, uh, 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 people will concern about, uh, you know, all the approval time, launch time, uh, etc. cetera. I, I um, uh, talked to uh, different uh, regulatory colleagues uh, in Asia, 
and we observe uh, a number of uh, impacts. And that's why, again, I recommend the, the colleague here in the call, you may consider to do some sort of uh, impact assessment as well because of this COVID. Uh, and also maybe some mitigation plan based on that, okay, so that we can prepare for that. So what's the learning here from different company in Asia is uh, we see the impact is uh, if you make it into more specific categories, uh, we impact our tests. Uh, when we, some country need to do product tests, our laboratory super busy nowadays, they need to test a lot of stuff uh, related to the virus thing rather than our product. So they may be busy. Some testing lab may be shut down. Some test lab may be the manpower, you know, quarantine, whatever. So the test delay. And then uh, some country we need to do, uh, I call it an audit. Uh, it's quite common in Asia that your regulator will come to your plan overseas to audit so that they can approve your product or approve your plan. And that audit, you know, nowadays I think difficult to happen, right? Uh, because of the travel. Uh, like that. And a lot of company, I mean country, also need panel meeting, expert panel meeting to review your product, efficacy, safety, etc. Again, that meeting, you no, know, not easy to happen nowadays, you know, uh, we cannot exceed some number and your expert from overseas cannot even fly in. Uh, you know, the local hospital expert may be also busy to deal with virus issues, no time to give advice to the panel. So, meeting, a problem. Of course, sometimes also to your own department that your team member also quarantine or, you know, all sorts of manpower issue can also happen in this uh, COVID-19 uh, like that. So, you know, there's a lot of specific uh, aspect of an impact. You cannot just say, oh, my submission time will be impact, but, but uh, I recommend the team to segregate this uh, into specific uh, so-called category. Because once you do that, you are able to find a solution to address that category. For example, uh, testing, I see company to, to find that um, there's a possibility and, uh, to negotiate with the testing lab, for example, in China, to, you know, sometimes uh, 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 waive some tests, sometimes mix some tests quicker uh, 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 so that you can prioritize a little bit so that uh, you don't delay your approval. Uh, and then some audit, uh, of course, uh, like the common manufacturer audit, uh, I also see company able to convince the regulator uh, for this particular scenario, please accept our paper audit, you know, based on the audit, uh, uh, based on our quality system document, uh, ISO certificate, et cetera, what, and just go oversee and see yourself. And then maybe after that, you can do a, uh, supplementary audit later on. And the meeting maybe become virtual meeting so that the expert in, in overseas can talk to the regulator in, in Asia like that. So, you know, um, when you identify all the little, little uh, roadblock, then your mitigation plan will become, you know, relatively uh, feasible. I mean, uh, 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 you'll be able to target it and then uh, and can do something about it. So far, when I look at all the regulator, when different so-called company negotiate or discuss with them, they are very receptive about this situation because it's not a company intent to delay or hide something, or please don't come to my manufacturer. Uh, my manufacturer fine, it's not like that, but they understand, you know, uh, the situation, even themselves, even Japan is ready, they cannot travel as well uh, like that. And they cannot just forever, stop everything until so-called the virus thing settle, you know, at the moment, nobody really know when. So uh, uh, as a mixed sense uh, approach, they will always uh, work with us to identify a, a so-called second option, which is we don't compromise patient safety efficacy, of course, but, you know, still makes sense to go ahead. Like I mentioned, virtual meeting, you know, okay. Uh, a paper audit, you know, not bad, uh, 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 et cetera. Uh, so uh, that's, um, that's the, uh, uh, I call it um, uh, the impact assessment I want the team to do, and also the mitigation plan I want the team to develop afterwards. Uh, but one more point I want to mention is um, uh, um, 
uh, is the uh, another tips I want to mention is because whatever we do in this particular time is we want actually product launch. You know, approval is just one step, but there are always the, 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 this virus ish problem not only affect regulatory, but also affect your supply chain, right? Your well, whatever department to generate label, maybe other department. So you know your whole product launch was impacted, not just the regulatory. So I've, I would think this is uh, another important approach is you should align all your different functional team or department to really address this issue. And I see, you know, um, this is, uh, I find it is a very uh, helpful tips that uh, or helpful thing at least for me is uh, uh, when I, as a regulatory department, I always uh, work with different functional team to design the whole product launch uh, so-called milestone that I know when the label will regenerate, when the production will start, and when you're going to launch. And then with my regulatory timetable, when you will come, I know how does it impact each step. And then I'm able to work with a different functional team to ask them, hey, production, you can start now because my approval will come next month. And label, you can also start when because production start, they need label, uh, et cetera. You know, so you don't work like sequential that department RA done, then finish job finish. Other department take care of the rest. You don't, you don't care what's going on there. And then, you know, uh, like sequential. But now if we are here overlapping all the steps, I see a lot of opportunity. You can save time on your, on your product launch. Uh, and I see uh, uh, this, also a good practice not doing the virus time, doing your other product launch time is also a very helpful approach. Uh, I, I, my, my, my company are very happy that we have a very quick product launch about a product nine months earlier last year uh, with this similar approach. And if the team interests, uh, uh, of course, uh, you can let Pierre know that we will, uh, you know, maybe organize another webinar to talk about how different functional team to work together so that we can make product launch quicker uh, like that. Uh, so I again pause here. Uh, I hope you found this uh, impact assessment, mitigation plan, and how to work with other functional team to make a smoother and quicker product launch uh, uh, helpful to you. Thank you, that's very helpful. So I think the takeaways here are one that in, in a time like this, not to just think about reg teams working in a silo to push for approvals, but overall work as a cross-functional team within the organization to push, come up with strategies of how you're going to move forward. Um, not be hesitant, but rather very open to having discussions with the agencies to come up with creative ways to overcome the delays that could be caused due to uh, local testing, labs, um, you know, audits, especially leveraging your current audit and, uh, and QMS certificates to, to at least get approval now and then they can always come back in a future, at a future date to audit your facility. So being creative in those ways and having those open discussions with authorities because um, what we are understanding is that Mr. Wong, that you, your experience in Asia right now is that, that the, the agencies are open to those discussions and those suggestions and they will consider those. Yes, yes. and. Uh, feel confident because you don't, Asia regulator, they are still in the learning phase. You can see even their regulation is still actively improving like the classification in Thailand. So they, 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 are, they are eager to learn, you know, it's not like a regulator say that, you know, then uh, done deal, you know, uh, uh, they, they're happy to learn about your justification. Uh, as long as there's no compromise to efficacy safety, you know, to a patient then everything I would say is, uh, is uh, negotiable, I say that. Got it. Um, and, and for the audience, just know that we, there are additional changes in Asia. It's tough to cover everything in 30 minutes. Um, the topic of COVID was very important, so we wanted to integrate that, but we will definitely schedule at one of our next webinars, we'll be covering another Asian market and we'll cover just that and get back to our, our original um, uh, 
format where we just cover that one country. But before we go, um, you know, I know we're running out of time, but there is another question about this trend of receiving. So one of the clients has received several requests for notary legalization and apostille for documents um, in Asia and, and perhaps even with Thailand. Is that becoming is that becoming a standard for documents that are submitted to do legalization and notary? Right. Um... I uh, I uh, I want to answer this question in a in a few points. Uh, number one, yes, uh, in Asia, some country to require notarization, legalization, uh, etc. Uh, uh, there's uh, I want to provide few points. Number one, why they do this? You know, sometimes I really want to come to understand why first because uh, uh, that's important. And then uh, the second thing is a, the answer to the questions. Uh, so why they do it is um, when I talk to the regulator, you know, well, my, my certificate uh, is so good, so clear already. Why, why you still need this additional notarization? Somebody put a chop there. Why, why spend effort and time for that kinds of thing? You know, every country believe the document I provide to them. But please understand, you know, in um, in uh, Asia setting, a lot of our regulator, unfortunately, receive a lot of fake document. Unfortunately, you know, they, you know, even money can be fake. You know, certificate can also be fake. So uh, uh, some country, they go through that kinds of uh, bad bad history or experience before. So some critical 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 document. They want uh, some legalization. No, no, no. You go to my embassy in in US to put a stamp there. Then I believe that document because they have my embassy stamp and they have a record. Then I can believe that's a real document, not coming from somewhere you you pin from your printer only uh, like that. So uh, that's the logic behind. Okay, so very difficult to negotiate. Say no, believe me, it's good. Is this document is real? So that's. Point one. And point number two is um, uh, these kinds of requirements is very confusing because some require some document don't require and some requirement require. And then some country need this, some country need different. So that's why uh, in our association, the Asia Regulation Professional Association, we have a website and list out all these um, different country requirements. You know, for some reason, I don't know why it's a secret in most of the uh, wherever database, but we already developed a database that you can go to our, our so-called website, uh, asiaregulatory.com, uh, very easy to remember. Then inside there, there's a database tag, and then you go to database, you just ask which country requirement you want to know. Maybe you click uh, uh, Thailand or Indonesia, then they will tell you, okay, they need an ISO certificate. Yes, do you need to be legalized? Uh, no. Then you know able to identify what document require, what kinds of documentation legalization is require, etc. So I hope that will be a you know an easy way to let the, the team know to to identify what document uh, uh, need the legalization thing, uh, notarization thing. So I hope that that answer the question in this way. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Um, and actually, our system can also uh, help with that in helping you understand the regulations and which product or documents require legalization and notary and or all three or just one. Um, it can get very confusing. And it is also something to think about as you think of your timelines, because this is added time and effort. But uh, Thank you so much. We went over time, but Mr. Wong, really appreciate your insight and experience and uh, what you brought to the table today. So thank you once again. Thank you again and have a good day and stay strong, exercise and yes. wash hands. Yes. <laughs> thank you everyone. And uh, we'll definitely see you all again at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Take care.